Hello, Happy New Year, and welcome to another Hip Historian event featuring Marshall Shore. I am Brenda Holt with the Arizona State Office of AARP. We are the nation's largest nonprofit organization dedicated to powering people 50 and older to choose how they live as they age. With a nationwide presence of nearly 38 million members across the nation and approximately 900,000 right here in Arizona, we work to strengthen our communities and we advocate for what matters most to families, such as health security, financial stability, and personal fulfillment. In the month of January, we will focus on the thriving job market. Despite the pre-pandemic unemployment levels, workers of all ages, but especially those 55 and older, are increasingly concerned about an uncertain and ever-changing job market. With high inflation, higher costs, and a possible recession have made older workers less confident in their ability to get a job or continue to grow in their careers. AARP is a wise friend and fierce defender of older workers and has programs, offerings, and resources to help. In an uncertain economy and rapidly changing market, you can count on AARP to help you navigate your job search and career path and fight back against age bias. We are also fighting to strengthen age discrimination laws, increase protections, and help companies across the country foster age-diverse workforces that value experience. Visit us at aarp.org backslash work for tips, tools, and resources to help stay competitive in the job market. Thank you again. And with that, I will turn it over to Marshall. Well, hello and good evening. I want to welcome you all to Arizona History Happy Hour. I am so happy that you all can be here on this Thursday of January 19th. Oh my gosh, so much fun stuff is going on. So I want to welcome you all, whether you are watching on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, or LinkedIn, or even maybe you're listening on Spotify, which is now a possibility. So today, January 19th, there's a lot going on. Why back in 1926, Margaret Rowe Clifton, who wrote the official lyrics for the Arizona State Song or the Arizona March Song, that was adopted in 1915. Now she passed away back in 1926 on this date, but did you know we also have two? I mean, you know, we have lots of one things, but you know, Arizona, we have two state songs. One is the alternative, which is just called Arizona, which was done by Rex Allen and Rex Allen Jr. And so if you go on YouTube, you can find both of them and, you know, you'll likely find out why they may have chosen to have an alternate state song called Arizona. So today is also National Brew a Potion Day. Now, you know, potions have been a part of kind of popular culture from Shakespeare to Harry Potter. Um, and through Hollywood movies and games like Minecraft, they are magical cures for diseases. Some even induce love. It is also 10 Can Day. A day where the humble tin can that allows us to preserve so much. Some ways good. Some ways, not so good. I would say, you know, if you want to, it's like, you know, canned corn, much better than canned spinach. That's all I'm going to say about that. We are going to move on to the next yummy, delicious day, which is National Popcorn Day. 
So whether you like it gourmet or whether you make it at home, whether you like it buttered, salted, kettled, drizzled with caramel, it is one of those snacks that is easy to make as well as you can elevate it in so many different ways and is enjoyable anywhere in a theater, in your home, in your car. Now, just remember to hopefully have a toothpick or something to kind of dig those holes out of your teeth. So it is also national. Now, let's see. You know, what I love about this day, it is national tenderness towards existence day, which I think is really cool. So it is a day where we celebrate that quiet, warm feeling of joy, connection with all creatures on this beautiful planet that we call home. There are almost 8 million people who live on Earth. We all share this home with millions of other species. And every single one of those species is unique and plays a role in their environment. So there you have January 19th. What can you expect from tonight's show? Well, you know, we've got a little bit of trivia. We've got from the vault, which is something you might drive by, but not know more about it. We also do a little bit of music history as well as little Arizona. And of course there's a beverage and oh, such a special guest. So this is your first time watching. You might wonder, who is that man and why is he on my screen? Well, my name is Marshall Shore. I got to Arizona a little over 23 years ago. I was working in Brooklyn at a Carnegie Library, decided to trade all that snow slush, bone chilling wind. Traded that for a little library in Central City, South Phoenix, where there was a rich oral tradition of the community. And so kind of, I started learning about Arizona through its stories. Then promptly moved into a beautiful 1956 ranch, which is still pretty much a time capsule because there's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile in the well oven Matching stovetop, it all still works like a charm. Now, as soon as I got here, I'll keep hearing about how there was no history here. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, whether it was on a bike, on a car, on a bus, on foot, wherever, I kept running across so many amazing people, places, and stories. Now, I'm also called the hip historian because I get to do just that play with some of those Arizona stories. And so we've been doing a lot with Local Buzz, which is an app kind of like TikTok, but it's hyper local. Um, you can download that and have lots of fun learning about your community. We just did a bit for a show that just opened up over in Scottsdale um, for Rip Woods. At the Scottsdale Public Library over in their gallery at the Civic Center Library. Um, so we just did a bit on that with Local Buzz promoting that. I'm going to be next week. I am going to be out in Apache Junction as we continue their winter lecture series. And I'm going to be talking about one of my passions, vintage signs. Also coming up. In February, we are going to be doing a VIP Willow Home Tour. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So be sure to check that out. Now, I know in order to get access to the special tour that we're doing, you've got to buy a Twilight ticket the night before that Saturday night. And then you'll get the option to hopefully buy a seat on the trolley. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Um, we just released our LGBT story time community history podcast with Sister Navi Ho. So check that out. I'm going to be off in next week. Also, I'm going to be out in Tempe with Equality Arizona as we get a chance to talk about 
some history about Arizona. Shocking, indeed. And then coming up also in February, Hats and High Tea at the Pioneer and Memorial Park. You can check out their website for more information on how to get tickets and more information, but it's going to be a great way to support the cemetery and its preservation efforts of so many headstones and so many stories. And then I'm excited because coming up in March is going to be Arizona Unzipped, an educational burlesque show where we're going to tell history lessons through burlesque. That's going to be a lot of fun. And it's going to be at the amazing Orpheum. So talk about more history on more history with a side of history. And live music and amazing dance. What an exciting night that will be. Now you can reach out to me. Some of you may have already found the chat. You can also reach out to me on Facebook, Instagram, email, or website. Um, basically, hiphistorian.com is my website. Hello at hiphistorian.com. And you can reach because, you know, maybe you've got a great idea for a guest because, you know, some of my best ideas have come from you all. And tonight we have a very special beverage that's on theme with kind of, you might notice my background is a little intergalactic. And so tonight we are having a little bit of Santan. Oh, and this green screen does not like that at all. All right. So it is Santan Moon Juice Galactic IPA. It's an out-of-this-world IPA crafted with tons of galaxy and Nelson Savan hops that transcends all earthly pleasures and meeting an aroma of peach, apricot, and tropical fruit. Oh, that's refreshing. All right. Well, now is Little Arizona. So, you know, I talk a big game about being from New York, but, you know, I really grew up in Indiana in a little tiny farm town. Super tiny. About 25 people. But that gives me, I think, a, you know, I enjoy a lot of big cities, small cities. So tonight we are going to talk a little bit about Bullhead City, which is in Mojave County, kind of tucked right up there in the corner. You've got Nevada, you've got California, you've got Arizona, and it's kind of right up there. Now its population is just over 41,000 people, and it was founded back in 1942. Now the town started because of Davis Dam. It was the headquarters, and that's where they lived and worked to build Davis Dam that stretches across Arizona and into Nevada as well. And it's got lots of water, as you can imagine. I'm, I don't know what those water levels are doing now. Hope they're doing okay. But, you know, as its history, it originally started off called Hardyville. And it was famous for a ferry crossing, steamboat landing, that were all to support those local mines that were popping up. Now, they also do have a Pioneer Cemetery as well, which you can go visit and learn more of the history about what Hardyville and some of its early pioneers. But, you know, it even goes earlier than that. The early inhabitants of this area were the Mojaves. That rich soil and plentiful water provided the ground for farming to make things grow. Now, there is a legend, according to the Mojaves, that life began on Spirit Mountain, which is the highest peak visible from Bullhead City. The first account where they started making contact with non-Indigenous folks were Spaniards back in the mid 15. 50s. And so from there, 
things continue happening, you can go check out. They do have a local Colorado River Museum where you can learn about all kinds of history, all about Bullhead City and its environment. All right. And now it is time for my favorite part of the show and possibly yours is where the fact that you get to hear from another voice, not just mine. And so I am so excited that this evening we are able to bring a super special guest on. And, you know, there might even be a little bit of chill in the air where he is, but we will learn all about that in just a moment. I want to bring on my friend, Kevin. Hello, great to see you. Good to see you. So, Kevin, so folks that don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Kevin Schindler. I'm the Historian and Public Information Officer at Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff. And I've been here 20, gosh, 28 years. Um, and as far as I know, it's still counting up. Um, so I, I worked in our outreach program, the public program for years, giving tours and doing telescope viewing and such. Um, and now um, I do you know, kind of take care of our history and um, that involves some exhibits and giving programs and stuff like that. So it's a really fun place to work and, and Lowell is is expanding with what we do for visitors and certainly our science is real top notch. So it's a, it's a really neat piece of uh, Arizona heritage and it's fun to be able to be part of it. Yeah, and I'm assuming also it's a place that probably a lot of folks, you know, I hear a lot about it, but most people I know have, have not actually been there. So I'm looking forward to, I know it's always on my list. So next time I get up there, stopping by the observatory. Oh yeah, you've got an out. open invitation. There's so much to see here. And and it's it's fun because people of all ages, you don't have to have any special background to come in. And, you know, there's a lot of neat astronomy and history and stuff to learn. But at nighttime, when you can look through a telescope and gaze at Saturn or a star cluster or galaxy, and when you're looking through that eyepiece, it's just you and what you're looking at. And it's really a great connection to the universe, a real, a real fun feeling. So it's something that everybody should do. I'm not, I don't say that because I work a low. I think I work a low because of that, because it really is such a unique experience to be able to look through telescopes and kind of connect with the world around us, the universe around us a little bit. Indeed. And you're going to talk about some of those super fun connections because we're getting ready to do some trivia. Yes. So now our trivia works a little different here than if you've got Dunbar trivia, where it's not so important that here's the answer and we're done. But we're go going to go through the questions that are all multiple choice. And then, you know, if you don't know the answer, just guess. And then we're going to come back and actually... Kevin's going to talk about some of the answers and those stories behind them, which are, oh my gosh, just wait. This is going to be so exciting. So I am so happy to be able to do this. Now, you know, you can keep track of, I know Anita keeps track of hers and a special notebook. It's like, however you would like to do it, feel free to do it as we get ready to do some trivia. All right. What product has Lowell Observatory been compared to? Is it A, a Swiss Army knife, B, Lucid Motors, C, Mesquite Bean Pods, or D, Bausch & Lomb? So one of those products has been compared with Lowell Observatory. Which one do you think it is? All right. Question two. Which Arizona city had the world's first outdoor lighting ordinance. Was it A, Sedona, B, Flagstaff, C, Tucson, or D, Camp Verde? All right. So it is indeed one of those places right here in Arizona. And question three. Who discovered Pluto at Lowell Observatory? Was it A, Kit San Pedro, B, Burrell Schmidt, C, Klein Tomba, or D, Pierce McMath. So one of those folks at Lola Zavari did indeed discover Pluto. All right. Question four. 
The symbol for Pluto is a combination of the first two letters of the founder's name, but that name Pluto came from where? A, love of a certain Disney character. B, an 11-year-old British girl. C, Percival Lowell's initials. Or D, the Greek god of the underworld. All right. Question five. The first evidence of what first was discovered at Lowell? Was it A, a black hole? B, the expanding universe? C, that the Earth moves around the sun? Or D, Jupiter's moons? So which of those do you think was first discovered at Lowell? Question six. What piece of pop culture has the Tark Clark telescope been seen on? Was it A, Carl Sagan's original Cosmos series? B, Bill Nye the Science Guy? C, The Big Bang Theory? Or D, Leonard Nimoy's program? So which piece, which part of pop culture do you think the Clark Telescope has been seen on? Question seven. Founder Percival Lowell is buried where? A, the Peaceful Valley Memorial Park. B, the Lowell Observatory Grounds. C, Greenwood Cemetery. Or D, Better Place Forest. So Percival Lowell, the founder of the observatory, is buried where? Question eight. Percival Lowell became a great popularizer of astronomy and the idea of life in the universe and inspired science fiction writers such as A, Edgar Rice Burroughs, B, H.G. Wells, C, Robert Goddard, or D, Carl Sagan. So which one of those authors do you think was inspired by the idea of life in the universe? Question nine, Stanley Sykes designed the dome of the Pluto Discovery Telescope and has a best-selling author connection to who? All right, is it A, Stephen Hawking? B, Diana Gabaldon? C, Ben Bova? Or D, Isaac Asimov? So which one of those has a connection to the builder of the dome? All right. Question 10. How many astronauts who walked on the moon came to the northern Arizona to train for their missions? Was it A, zero or nada? B, five? C, 22? Or D, all? How many astronauts do you think came to northern Arizona to train for their mission to the moon? All right. Oh, and we have some bonus question. Look at that. All right. Question 11. Lowell Observatory was established in 1894, 18 years before Arizona even became a state. What site was also considered? Was it A, Tombstone, B, Tucson, C, Tempe, or D, Prescott? All right, so while you are locking in your final answers, we are going to take a quick Arizona music break and talk about the artist Hans Olsen. Now, he moved to California in the late 60s. By the early 70s, he had his first record out on a Phoenix record label. He's played with over 100 musicians and is best known as a select. You can see him all over town. He's still performing. You can see him at the Rhythm Room over at, um, I know the American Legion Post One has had him multiple times, but you know, he has played with so many folks, including like Muddy Waters, B.B. King, Willie Dixon, John Lee Hooker, Stevie Ray Vaughan, and the list goes on and on. He's got 10 albums that he's, crea that he's, that he's recorded. And so he's still touring, not just through the Valley or Arizona, but also the U.S. and Europe. All right. 
So who's ready for some answers? I know I sure am because this has gotten... <laughs> it's like, hey, me, me over here, over here. Don't forget about me. All right. So what product was Lowell Observatory been compared to? A Swiss army knife. What? I can tell you a story about that. Oh my gosh. Fancy that. <laughs> 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 well, it's, you know, when we, we talk about this, we're talking about, um, our, we have a lot of different telescopes. That's kind of one of the main tools you have in an observatory. And our main research telescope today, the kind of the cornerstone is called the Lowell Discovery Telescope. And it's the um, fifth largest telescope in the continental U.S. And we talk about a telescope, it's not necessarily, we're not talking about the length of it, but how wide it is. Because you have a big mirror that collects light. And so think of that, that mirror is like a, a bucket that collects light. The bigger the bucket, the more light it collects. Um, so when we talk about telescope, we're talking about how wide um, they are, how big a bucket they are. Um, and so this is one of the most power, one of the biggest in the continent of the United States. It measures 4.3 meters across, which is about 14 feet. That's one piece of glass. Um, but what makes the telescope even more unique is that it's got a really unique instrument, what's called an instrument cube on the end. Um, and an instrument cube holds instruments um, because it, the telescope collects light, but then you have different instruments to break the light down and kind of analyze it. Um, traditionally, big research telescopes, you could have like one big instrument at a time. And then if you want to use a different instrument, like maybe you have something that takes pictures but you want to use something like a photometer that looks at the brightness of things. It could take hours or longer to take one instrument off, put another one on. Um, and that's a lot of lost time observing. With the instrument cube, you have five different instruments and you just push a button and within like half a second, um, the whole instrument cube rotates and the light can go through a different instrument. Um, and so, it's you, you essentially can use all the instruments almost simultaneously. And so it's powerful because like if one of our astronomers discovers a comet, they might want to study it using different instruments, different ways of looking at it. And they can use all of them um, rather than, okay, well, we'll use the photometer, then we'll take that off. We'll, we'll lose a bunch of hours. Um, you can do it almost all simultaneously. So that's why um, our... Our director, our former director, Bob Millis, um, said this is such a versatile telescope because you can use it with all these instruments. It's like a Swiss army knife of telescopes. That is so funny. Yeah, because it's like a Swiss army knife. You have all those things. You just sit there and yeah. really quickly. That's really cool that you're able to do all that. And so that, yeah, it's a powerful thing. And, and the Lowell Discovery Telescope, it's located about 40 miles southeast of Flagstaff and a little community called Happy Jack. Um, but you can also see the dome. You can see it kind of sticking up when you're driving out there just for briefly sticking up out of some trees. But if you're on I-17 driving north, heading to the Verde Valley, um, there's the um, General Crook exit. And if right around where that exit is, if you know where to look kind of to the northeast, especially at, at sunset or in the afternoon when the sun angle is low, the sun will be um, reflecting off that dome and you can see a little, like a little pimple of light. Um, and so that's kind of a neat thing. I mean, you don't want to stare at that while you're focused driving, but if you know where to look, I mean, once you see it, you say that's can it. do that. We'll yeah. let the passengers stare at that yes. little endpoint of light. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Which Arizona city had the world's first outdoor lighting ordinance? Flagstaff. Yes, and maybe this is a partial trick question because I'm from Lowell Observatory and, and that's where Lowell is, Lowell is. And so maybe you think, maybe it's where this guy's from. Um, and it is because, um, you know, we think about Arizona and it's a Mecca for astronomy research and has been for decades. It's one of the world's leading centers for astronomical research. And there are observatories in many parts of the state, plus the universities, University of Arizona, Arizona State University, 
North and Arizona University. All three state universities have major astronomy and physics programs and are involved with space missions and major astronomy research. Um, so there's this long legacy of astronomy being done here, starting with Lowell Observatory in 1894. Um, so Lowell was established 18 years before Arizona even became a state. Um, so it's kind of grown up with the state. And so one of the reasons our founder came here was because the skies were dark. And, um, but by the 1950s, you had light pollution um, from you know city lights and automobiles and such that are shining light up. And the more artificial light you shine at the sky, the less you can see of the stars and such. And in the late 1950s, Lowell was looking at acquiring a new telescope from the Perkins Observatory in Ohio. Um, we'd set it up out here. Skies are a lot clearer than where it's cloudy a lot over in Ohio, where I grew up. And so um, we decided to set it up. But one of the issues was, you know, we've got this really dark sky site outside of town, but there are some searchlights that occasionally will flash through the, the night. And our astronomers said, you know, that's going to that's going to negatively impact looking at the stars. And so one of our astronomers, who at one time happened to be mayor of Flagstaff, um, Earl Slifer, he talked to the city council and said, what can we do to do this? We don't want to, we don't want to get rid of, you know, searchlights, but just to moderate their use. Um, you know, it, do they need to be shining all night, for instance? And so the city created an ordinance, this was in 1958, um, kind of moderating the use of that, that light. And as it turns out, that was the world's first outdoor lighting ordinance anywhere. Um, so that, that kind of set the, the trend. And through the years, Flagstaff and Coconino County have, have created other ordinances and modified them um, and kind of led the way in a lot of ways in dark sky protection. And in 2001, Flagstaff, because of these efforts, was de designated as the world's first international dark sky city and continues to be a leader. And today, there are a lot of dark sky communities in Arizona, mm -hmm. um, Fountain Hills, um, Sedona, as well as parks like um, Grand Canyon National Park is a certified. Oh. And so so there's there's not just in Arizona around around the world, but Arizona is, certainly plays a key um, in in showing how it's done. And that all started here in Flagstaff. Wow, that's real. I didn't realize that we started that whole trend. Look at us leading yeah. the blazing trails again. Yes, blazing trails that you can't see very well, hopefully. <laughs> I mean, I <laughs> Indeed. All right. So who discovered Pluto at Lowell Observatory? And it was C, Clyde Tomba. Yeah, Clyde Tomba. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, you might think maybe Percival Lowell, he's the guy that founded the observatory. And Percival Lowell, in fact, in 1905, began searching for a, a ninth planet he believed was out there. He called it Planet X, because in mathematics, X is the unknown. So um, Planet X is the unknown planet that he believed was out there. And the reason he thought it was there is because Uranus and Neptune were kind of wobbling in their orbits. And, and, and they couldn't, scientists couldn't account for that at the time. And so Percival Lowell and some others figured that there must be another planet out there whose gravity is tugging on them, causing them to wobble. Um, Percival Lowell and his team searched for this from 1905 until 1916 uh, when Lowell passed away. But a decade later, um, observatory leadership said, you know, Uncle Percy was onto something. Um, we should recommence that search. And just as they're looking at, at getting the search going, they, they talked to Lowell's brother, who's president of Harvard. He donates money for a new telescope. And the director said, OK, we've got a telescope. We need somebody to actually do the work because there's only three scientists. The director is busy. Uh, one of the scientists, Earl Slifer, was in the state legislature um, doing politics. And then there's one other astronomer that did some more galactic studies, stuff outside of the solar system. And so just as our director, Vesto Slifer, is trying to figure out who's going to do this, he gets a letter from this 23-year-old farmer in Burdett, from Burdett, Kansas, who apparently, you know, at nighttime, what do you do in Kansas? <laughs> um, you know, during the day, there's farming. What do you do at night? He's got, he lives on a farm, so he built his own telescopes. 
and and he learned the sky on his own, and he got pretty good at drawing the planets as he saw through the telescopes. So he wanted to send them to an observatory, a professional observatory, to get their take on, you know, how good was he with his drawings? And so he sent some of these drawings to Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff because he knew about Lowell as a place that did solar system studies, you know, studying planets and stuff in the solar system. And he got a letter back that said, well, you like your drawings. Um, what kind of physical condition are you in? Um, are you used to staying up late at night? And, and the timing was perfect because they just happened to be looking for an assistant to help with the Pluto search. Turned out this young guy, Clyde Tombaugh, was perfect. Um, and so they hired him um, just on a temporary basis, just as a trial run. And within a year, he discovered um, the ninth planet, Pluto. Um, he was 24 years old when he discovered it. And, um, you know, you think about this, he was a self-taught astronomer. He, he, after discovering a planet, he got a um, scholarship to go to University of Kansas. And one of the great stories is um, he went into the, you know, Astronomy 101 class and sat down and the teacher saw his name, Clyde Tomba. He said, okay, you've passed the class already. If you've discovered a planet, you don't have to go through this class. You've passed. <laughs> so, yeah, Clyde Tomba. Um, he lived into his 90s, and he still has family living in New Mexico um, and elsewhere, and and we're really pleased to, to celebrate his heritage here. Okay, now you mentioned Pluto and planet, mm -hmm. and I know there's been some question. I don't. It, it, keeps, it seems to keep flip-flopping. Well, let's see. How much time do we have? <laughs> um, so, so Pluto was 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 initially called a planet. And, and over time, some scientists questioned if it should be called a planet, largely because of its size. Because Percival Lowell thought there would be a really big planet, like a Jupiter-sized planet, um, and covered. But as, it, as time went on, scientists first realized Pluto is a lot smaller than we thought. And it got to the point where we realized this supposed planet Percival Lowell thought was out there actually doesn't exist. Um, they just happened to find this thing we call Pluto right where he thought something was. So it was a very serendipitous um, discovery. If you systematically look at the sky, there's a good chance you'll discover something, at least back then before we had so many telescopes looking at the sky. Um, and so Pluto is called a planet um, over the years. The size, it seemed kind of small. It, it, it was kind of, its orbit, instead of being kind of in a plane, it's kind of in an angle. Um, and so in, in the, um, Several years back, the official body, governing body that decides on what to call things, the International Astronomical Union, they decided to reclassify Pluto as a dwarf planet. And there's a lot of debate. I think it, what it comes down to today is for those scientists who study planets, they call Pluto a planet in general. For those who don't study planets, who study stars and such, a lot of them say, no, it's not a planet. It's, it's Okay, call it a dwarf planet, but that's not a planet per se. Um, so it, it, it's still confusing because um, because like a dwarf star is a type of star, a dwarf galaxy is a type of galaxy. But under this definition, a dwarf planet is not a type of planet. Now, for those for most people who study planets, I, I won't say all, but the majority, they say, okay, yeah, we'll call a fluid a, a dwarf planet because it's small. But it's, it's a type of planet. You have the inner terrestrial planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. You have the outer gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And then Pluto is this third zone of planets. And Pluto is the prototype of these icy bodies in the outer solar system. So if you're looking for consensus among scientists on what to call it, um, good luck. You're not going to get it. <laughs> so, so it's... Um, you know, it's to me, I think, you know, we still call it a planet. I think, um, you know, there's no official stance by Lowell Observatory. It's different astronomers feel different things. Um, but I think in general, like I said, if you study solar system objects, um, you tend to call it a planet. The other thing is how it was done. The International Astronomical Union voted um, on whether to call it a planet or not. And that's just not done with science. You don't vote. Scientists don't get in the room and vote on things. It's more by kind of general consensus is 
you write, a, you do research, you write a paper, and um, if scientists agree, they maybe write further papers supporting it, or if they disagree, um, they write papers and say, no, no, you're not right, and this is why. And then over time, you kind of build a consensus, but they don't, they don't sit in a room and, and vote. Now, there's, there's one, one last footnote with Pluto. Um, we didn't have this in one of the trivia questions, but I think we have to add it as an extra bonus. Um, Clyde Tombaugh is related to a famous major league baseball pitcher. Um, who is he? He's won two or three Cy Young Awards. Um, is his Clayton Kershaw of the Dodgers? Uh, oh, Clayton wow. Tombaugh is, is, I, I think it's great uncle. I think that's what it is, but they're related. Um, um, Clayton Kershaw, um, the one side of the family are Tombaugh's. So, so yeah, there's another good trivia question. Um, Indeed. That's pretty cool. You win several Cy Youngs, and by the way, you're your uncle also discovered a planet. Right, exactly. It's like look in the sky and look. Yeah, I, you had three Cy Youngs. Well, I found a planet. <laughs> Family unions trying to one up each other. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Question four: The symbol for Pluto is a combination of the first two letters, but the name came from an eleven-year-old British girl. Named Venetia Burney. And after Pluto was discovered, and, and this is kind of a combination answer because, because the name Pluto um, is, is a mythological character, the god of the underworld. Um, so after Pluto was discovered, it was discovered on, on February 18th, 1930, but the observatory didn't announce it until several weeks later because they wanted to study it more and make sure what they saw was real. <laughs> And that's the spec on one of their photographs, and it actually wasn't there. So they studied it for several weeks. Again, Percival Lowell had passed away by this point, um, but he's the one that had started the search. And so they study it from February 18th for a few weeks. So we get to the starting to get to mid March, and, and the observatory decided, okay, this is a planet. We're going to announce it to the world. So they decided to announce it on March 13th, 1930. March 13th is the date that William Herschel discovered Uranus in 1781. But March 13th, 1930, would have been Percival Lowell's 75th birthday also. So what, ah. what a great way of celebrating um, Percival Lowell. And, and so after it was discovered and, and announced, it made news headlines around the world. And as the story goes, um, in England, there was 11-year-old Venetia sitting around the breakfast table with her grandparents. And she said, you know, I've been studying mythology in school. They should call that planet Pluto because Pluto is the god of the underworld, the most cold, distant region. And that's where Pluto, the, this thing is, it's really in a cold area, it's way out there. And so her grandpa knew an astronomer. Um, so grandpa contacted the astronomer and then sent, and he sent a telegram to Lowell Observatory suggesting the name Pluto, um, as suggested by Venetia. Oh, now, the observatory wow. received several hundred suggestions from around the world. We still have a lot of those telegrams and letters suggesting all sorts of names. Um, but Venetia's suggestion of Pluto was the first suggestion of Pluto. We got, I think, more than a dozen people suggested Pluto, but hers was the first one that came in. And wow. so, well, she, she didn't technically name it, um, the observatory. Um, did, but she suggested the name and they followed her lead. And in, in the announcement about the name, it said, you know, we've decided to call Pluto as first suggested by Venetia Burney. Um, so, and she went on to become a school teacher. And so that was kind of her, what a, what a neat little thing to put on your resume. Uh, right, exactly. That you named the planet. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But that's great that they took kind of that public influence. Right. And, uh, you know, there's another thing with it that goes with the name also. Um, and that's that the, the planets all have symbols. They're not necessarily scientific, you know, used in science circles, but in kind of everyday life, um, astrology, sometimes you see them. Um, 
And so Mars is a circle with the arrow pointing up, like the symbol for males. Mm -hmm. Venus is a circle with the cross pointing down like females. Well, for, for Pluto, um, the, the scientists here at Lowell said, well, we like the name Pluto for a symbol. Let's use a combination of its first two letters, a P and L. Oh, which, so that's where that way, comes from. Oh. Those are the initials of Percival Lowell. And so what a great tribute. They announced the discovery on what would have been his 75th birthday. And they give it a name whose symbol, um, you know, cements his, his heritage forever with his initials. How cool is that? Yeah, that, you know, scientists are people too, <laughs> uh, for the most part. And so, <laughs> you so know, it can be said about any population for the yeah, most right. part. Yeah, so, most so. <laughs> um, all right. So the, the first evidence of what was discovered at Lowell? The expanding universe? Right. If we go back more than 100 years and um, Percival Lowell... Um, was running his observatory and he had some assistant astronomers who worked with him and he had his great 24 inch um, refracting telescope. So 24 inches in the diameter, it's actually 32 feet long. And if you come up to Flagstaff and you see what looks like a huge birthday cake on the side of the hill, that's the telescope that houses this old telescope. And it's been there, it's, it's the dome that houses the telescope. It's been there since 1896, um, this, this building. And so um, Percival Lowell had that telescope and he got an instrument called a spectrograph um, that when attached to the telescope, you can point it at things in space. And, and when the light comes through the spect telescope, the spectrograph, it breaks light down into its individual components. So, you know, you know, we can't travel to the sun, but by pointing or, or stars, but by pointing a telescope a spectrograph their way, we can look at the light and every element has like its own specific fingerprint of light, as it were. So you look at this pattern of light and know, oh, that's hydrogen. Oh, that's helium. So we can, that's how we tell what things are made of, even though we can't look, get there, we can look at their light. Well, um, Lowell had this instrument and he wanted the M. Slifer to look at these fuzzy blobs that were out in space. And they were then called spiral nebulae, which astronomers, many astronomers thought that they were young planets being formed, um, proto-planetary systems, you could call them. And so Percival Lowell wanted his assistant, Vesto Slifer, to study these. And he wanted to see if they were made of, of um, the same elements that you would find in um, planets and solar systems like Jupiter and Saturn. If the chemical signatures were the same, then, then maybe that would prove that these things are actually young solar systems. Well, turns out they didn't match. They had a different chemical signature. But what Vesto Slifer found, incredibly, by studying these things over um, taking pictures with exposures of dozens of hours, what the, the, was that these blobs in general were moving away from us in, at incredible speed, some in excess of 900 times the speed of sound. And this was completely unheard of um, in scientific circles when he announced the discovery of several of these blobs moving away so fast, he did announce them in a science meeting in 1914, and he got a standing ovation um, because scientists realized we don't know what to make of this, but it tells us what we do know is that the universe much, must be much older and larger. If these things are moving this fast, yeah. um, and e even if you multiply by since, you know, 1776, when... <laughs> The United States, you know, the Declaration of Independence was signed. Multiply, you know, 150 years times how fast these are moving. They, the universe has to be huge. And so that was the first evidence that the universe was expanding. Um, astronomers didn't really look at it that way yet. It wasn't until the 1920s that another name that most of us know, Edwin Hubble, um, he um, used Slifer's information as, as well as um, other astronomers' observations, ability to measure distances and such, um, to, to actually come up with the, an explanation for what this was, which he called the expanding universe. Um, so the first observational evidence was done right here at the observatory, right here in Flagstaff, with a telescope that visitors can still look through today. 
Um, so it's kind of that connection with the past. Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. All right. Question six. What piece of pop culture has had the Clark telescope seen on it? And it's all of those? Trick question. <laughs> no, we're never known for our trick questions. <laughs> but oh my gosh, that's so cool. I mean, everything from Carl Sagan to the Big Bang Theory. Right. And, and most of those... You know, the Cosmo, the original Cosmo theory that, that Carl Sagan did in the early 1980s, one of the episodes was about Mars. It was called Blues for Mars Planet. And and he did part of the episode from the telescope dome. And, and for those familiar with Carl Sagan, it, it's just, you can look it up on YouTube and see that segment. And it's listening to his voice and, you know, the billions and billions, you know, just his awe and wonder about the universe is still gives me goose pimples to, to listen to Tim speak, even though he's, he passed away in the 1990s, he still kind of is with us in a lot of ways. Um, those other shows, Leonard Nimoy interviewed Carolyn Shoemaker here back in the nineties and Carolyn um, at one time discovered more comets than anybody else in the world. And by the way, her husband was Gene Shoemaker, the father of astrogeology who headed up training astronauts here in Flagstaff and, and Carolyn, Carolyn had raised the kids, her husband's like this world leading geologist. After Carolyn, she's 50 years old or so, she's done raising the kids. And she said, Gene, what am I gonna do now? And he said, well, you know, I've got all the science going on, why don't you give me a hand? Um, and he was, he was studying um, impacts, um, you know, like on earth, like meteor crater, where oh, yeah. space rock is impacted. Um, so, so, um, He's studying these things, but also want to study the origin of these impacts, which are comets and asteroids. So he wanted to study the skies and look for comets and asteroids and maybe find some that could impact us. And so he said, well, why don't you help out with this? And she did. And she became so proficient, again, starting when she was 50, that she discovered um, something like, I think it was 23 comets. Um, there's automated programs that do it now, but but she held the record for years of the most comets discovered. And I think as a, as a final poetic thing, um, Gene and then Carolyn, he had spent his entire career looking at um, bodies from space and how they impact, impactors. In 1993, one of the comets they discovered along with um, another astronomer, David Levy, um, called Shoemaker Levy 9, they discovered that it was going to bash into Jupiter the following year, and it did. And astronomers around the world could view this and see these scarred patches when it impacted Jupiter. And how how beautiful is that? That they've studied their whole life, or Gene Shoemaker, his whole life studying impactors, and he discovers a comet that that for the first time in human history we're able to watch a solar system body impact another one, and they're the ones that discovered it. <laughs> It's, wow! You can't make this stuff up. It's really no. Amazing. That's so cool. And what I also like is that it's so many, you know, that it's gender neutral. I mean, the right. fact that it's like men and women have been yes. in, have had effects. And and you know, um, astronomy certainly through history is a male dominated field, and it still is. But there's certainly a place for everybody, and there's certainly a lot more women and people of color and others in the field. And it's and it's that. You know, at some point, you're seven years old, you look up the sky, you fall in love. That's what you want to do. You know, I, I just realized also, we, did, we didn't actually, um, another one of those answers that's kind of fun of that, that question of what the pop culture. Um, one of the other answers, um, yeah, Bill Nye, the science guy. I have a picture um, of me standing with him at the, at the old telescope. Um, that was back wow. in the 1990s. Um, but the Big Bang Theory, the TV show, this 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 is kind of cool because I you know I always liked the Big Bang Theory and several years ago my family watched it um, you know we've watched it sometimes so I was waiting for them to come home from dinner and I always remember watching the show and um, every once in a while I see a scene that looked like there's a telescope in the back right like a picture of a telescope and so I'm watching the show waiting for them 
and there was a scene with this poster. So I decided I got my remote quick and, you know, I achieved it. So I waited to come up, came up again. I paused it. And when I paused it, I thought, that's not just a telescope. This is the Clark telescope here at Lowell Observatory. And I recognized that picture was taken in the 1990s um, with one of our astronomers here. And that's our telescope in the show. And so um, that was great because it inspired me to watch um, a bunch more Big Bang Theory. And I found that it that poster is on the wall in season one, except I think except for the, the first episode, but it's on the wall for the entire first season. And then the next season they changed the decoration some and it's not there. But okay. it makes a cameo appearance on the on the poster there. Wow. The, you know, you know, again, you said you can't make that stuff up. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. And speaking of crazy, so question seven. Founder Percival Lowell is buried where? On the grounds of the Lowell Observatory? Yes. Within, I don't know, 100 feet of that classic um, Clark telescope built in the 1890s that's inside the big birthday cake looking building. Within 100 feet is this smaller building with a dome on it. And that's where Percival Lowell's entombed. His widow thought when he died unexpectedly in 1916, she thought he would appreciate being near his beloved telescope. Um, and what better building than a mausoleum that kind of looks like a little telescope dome. Um, and so as the story goes, he's in a, a box inside a coffin that's facing um, so that when Mars just rises in the sky, he can, you know, see Mars. Um, his beloved planet. So he's, it's bizarre. He's right, he's right on site. And so many people walk through that little building. I mean, there's a sign that says what it is and everything, but uh, you know, it's, it's unexpected. Um, Indeed. No, the, I mean, that just shows, I mean, how passionate he was. Yes. And, and I should say that there's another great observatory, a uh, Lick Observatory near San Jose. And the namesake James Lick is actually entombed underneath the telescope like in the pier of the telescope. Um, so Percival Lowell got his own building here. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know what it is about, you know, but, but you know, it's, it's interesting to think that, you know, we're not a cemetery here, but in some way, you know, we, we have our exalted founder is, is on site here. So be careful what you say when you're walking around the observatory. <laughs> Indeed, because you can still be listening. I, I've got to tell you one thing. Um, there's some great stories about the mausoleum. One, one is uh, back in the 1970s, we had some visitors here and they walked up to the mausoleum and it was during our rainy season. And they decided to go down to the, in the front of the mausoleum and look at it. And they saw what looked like blood coming out the door. And they went running back to the visitors and said, visitor center, there's blood coming out the door, like, you know, Amityville horror type stuff. And our staff was a little skeptical because Lowell had been dead for 50 or 60 years. <laughs> they <laughs> went up and it was during the rainy season and there was a pool of rust that was coming out the door. <laughs> and that, that was the blood that they saw. Um, soon after that, they, they um, the, um, casket that he was buried in was entombed in a stone box so you don't, uh, you don't see you don't see any pool of blood or anything like that or rust or anything else no <laughs> there was um gosh back in 2001 i think it was and we, we used to have a, a living history program at Lowell observatory where we would dress up as astronomers from the past and you know tell their story by um what we euphemistically called acting here because it was just our, us educators. So I was Percival Lowell. Um, the, the resemblance that's uncanny, um, we're male. Um, I was gonna say, I'm like, I think that's about it. <laughs> I, we both had glasses at one point. Um, and so, so anyways, I played him. So the last night we, we were done with Voices from the Past, we went up to the mausoleum to pay tribute to Percival Lowell um, to, to lift a glass of wine and toast him. And we went inside to toast and we walked outside 
and this and Jupiter was up. I mean, Mars was up, the red planet. So we're toasting first of all the red planets up the sky. We walked outside, and the whole sky was red. It was the glow. It was the northern lights. Um, when the sun was particularly active that year, and the sun sends when it, the more active it is, you hear about like radio interference. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's when we get more northern lights. Um, Aurora borealis in the north, Aurora australis in the south. Um, generally, we don't get them this far south. It's the only time in my life I've seen the northern lights. It was on the night that we were in Percival Lowell's mausoleum toasting him, and we came out in the sky, it was red. It was eerie. And in fact, there was a TV station in Phoenix. Um, that night, they reported a big fire north of town because the sky looked like it was on fire. Oh. And, and then later found out it was actually the Northern Lights. And, you know, you see a lot of pictures of Northern Lights that are kind of green streamers and bluish, but it depends on, it depends on what um, element is interacting. And so down here it was, it was, it was, I can't remember if it was oxygen that's red, but anyways, um, that's why they were red. But again, the only time I've ever seen them and they, they don't get this far south that often. So it was kind of a cool thing being in the mausoleum that, that night. Yeah, no, that would have been really cool walking out and seeing that. All right, question eight. Percival Lowell became a great popularizer of astronomy. And the idea of life in the universe has inspired science fiction writers, such as, and again, it's an all of the above. <laughs> And I guess I'm not sure if Robert Goddard actually wrote science fiction at all, but but Carl Sagan, who was a great scientist, also he wrote Contact, for instance, which became a movie. Which became a movie, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, you think about um, Percival Lowell. Well, think about today. You know what? You know we've been going through COVID the last couple of years, so books that are coming out, you know, a lot of books might have a theme about COVID because that's been in everybody's life right now. There's such an awareness about it. When we go back to the 1890s, and Percival Lowell was such a popularizer of science, even though his ideas about there being intelligent life on Mars proved to be wrong, and in fact, the supposed canals that were evidence of this life don't exist, but he was such an eloquent speaker and gifted writer that he built this consciousness that, okay, Maybe, maybe this isn't proof, but could there be life on Mars? It, this, this consciousness that there is life there. And so what do the writers of the time write about? They incorporate this Martian life into the writings, like Edgar Rice Burroughs and H.G. Wells. Um, and then they lay, it's interesting, you have a scientist inspiring writers who then inspire future scientists. And so, you know, Carl Sagan, knew about Percival Lowell's research, but he also read Edgar Rice Burroughs and H.G. Wells. That inspired him to go in science. And then you have, you know, some, some who were inspired to go into science and became astronauts. And they went to the moon and they inspired some of our astronomers today, um, who then inspired future science fiction writers. You know, it kind of is a continuation. It's, it's pretty neat. So Percival Lowell didn't intend to inspire writers to come up with science fiction, but he did. And it really, you know, it's had a really interesting impact. Right. I mean, I would say like today, um, oh gosh, the guy out of New York. Um, I think you know, the grass Tyson. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. I mean, he, I mean, I mean, again, I mean, I can only imagine it's kind of like, you're talking about hearing these people talk. It's like having him like there and seeing such animation and sharing so much passion. Right. And, that, and that's, they started out, you know, I think, you know, so many people, well, it does, it's not just science, it's so many walks of life where, you know, for so many of us, it's some golden age, it seems like seven or eight years old, that you're just so aware about the world around you, and you just fall in love with something, you, you know, you, be, you fall in love with animals, and you want to be a vet, or for me, I was picking blackberries one day, I was seven years old in Ohio, I was picking blackberries and found this rock with all these really cool looking like shells inside. And then I looked down, there's another rock and it had shells too. And I put them together and they fit together. It was a rock that had broken apart. And I instantly fell in love with fossils. And, and I went to school for that. 
And, you know, so, you know, one of our, or actually more of our scientists who grew up going to launches of Apollo missions to the moon, and that inspired them to want to go into space sciences, um, study space. And so it's, it's something that happens around us all the time. And that's something that we certainly want to do here at Lowell Observatory. Um, you know, we, we carry out um, leading research and also share the results of that research. We communicate science. And ultimately, we want to inspire people around the universe, especially kids, to you know, look around. And maybe if you like it enough, maybe you want to do this as your career. But if nothing else, you know, be aware of your surroundings. And that's the Big Dipper. I can point out the Big Dipper. I hate, I know that's Mars. Just that, just, just being able to look up and, and feel that connection to the universe. And that's something we want to inspire people to do. And indeed, I mean, and to be curious. Right. And it started with Percival Lowell, who said, what's the point of doing science unless you share it with people and make them co-discoverers? Um, you know, one person, Claytamba, discovered Pluto, but so many other people kind of co-discovered it. Like they feel like it's their planet today. Um, and so that, it's, it's an exciting thing. Indeed. All right. So question nine, Stanley Sykes designed the dome of the Pluto Discovery Telescope and has a best-selling author connection to whom? Diana Gabaldon. Yeah, Diana Gabaldon is the author of the Outlander series, which has also been made into a TV show. And her, her, um, her parents, her dad was a, was a state, I think state senator, but on the mom's side, it's the Sykes family. And so her, her great grandfather was mayor of Flagstaff at one time and his father was Stanley Sykes. Um, and Stanley and his brother Godfrey came over from England in the 1880s. They settled in Flagstaff. Um, they had a bicycle repair shop in downtown Flagstaff. I say downtown, it was you know a few buildings. But in 1896, when Percival Lowell was looking for, he was got his new telescope, this Clark telescope, the 32 foot long tube, but he needed a, play, a building to put it in. And so he went downtown and there is a shop, makers and menders of anything. And there was the Sykes brothers. And he went in and said, you make or mend anything, make me a telescope dome. Telescope's 40 feet long, figure out what to do. And they did. The brothers designed it. And that's the dome that still sits here today. Well, Godfrey left, but Stanley spent the rest of his career here. And so in the late 1920s, when we decided to recommence the search for, for a, a ninth planet, um, he designed a telescope dome um, based on that design they used for the old one. And that's the design they used for the Pluto Discovery Telescope. And that was Diana Gabaldon's great grandfather. Wow. In, in fact, one of, the, one of the fun things we're looking forward to in, uh, this year is um, in June, we're opening a new exhibit, um, historic exhibit about the Sykes brothers um, and Diana Gabaldon has loaned us several articles, um, artifacts um, from the family that we can use in the exhibit. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a really neat connection. Oh, wow. Yeah, let me know when that's going on. I mean, that would be fun to come up and see. Sure. I know it's, we're looking at June, probably. We don't okay. have everything set, but yeah. Very cool. All right. So question 10, how many astronauts who walked on the moon have come to Northern Arizona to train for that mission? All. Right. We, we think about the Apollo astronauts. Those were the astronauts in the 1960s and early 70s. And 12 different people walked on the moon. And another 12, in addition to that, orbited the moon. And all of them did some training in Northern Arizona, several up here at Lowell, but all of them around Northern Arizona because um, Gene Shoemaker, who kind of headed up a lot of the training of astronauts, he was, he was like other scientists who said, if all we do is send test pilots that are operating the, the spacecraft to the moon to plant a flag 
thumb our noses at the Russians and say we beat you, because that was the goal for going, was to beat the Russians, and to come back, then what a wasted opportunity. We should do science when we're there. And if we're going to do science, and we've got to train these guys. They're test pilots. They're not scientists. They're very smart. Um, but they're test pilots. And northern Arizona has the best preserved impact crater on Earth, meteor crater. And that's, that's like what they're going to see on the moon. Um, and we want to inspire them to learn geology. What more inspirational geologic place in the Grand Canyon? The geology may not be exactly the same as the moon or even close in some cases, but it, they all went there to get inspired about learning geology and how to, how to read the rocks. Because, you know, looking at rocks is like looking at a book. It tells a story. And so, so all the astronauts came here. Um, Neil Armstrong, the first to walk on the moon, um, he was here first in 1963 and came for several later training missions. Um, and I think what's so, to me, is so neat about this is we're now looking at going back to the moon. Um, right now, um, the plan is to send orbiters in 2020, I think 2024, is that right? And then the next year would be a lander. Those astronauts are still, current day astronauts, still come to Northern Arizona for training to hone their geology skills. Because when you go there, you're going to explore. Um, and they're, they're doing some of the, going to some of the same training places as the original Apollo astronauts went to. So this is, it's not just a footnote in history, but when we are back on the moon, I'm hoping that we can say every astronaut past and present who's walked on the moon trained here in Arizona. Wow. And they trained elsewhere also, but but this was one of the key places. Right. That's just amazing. And then we have our bonus question. Lowell Observatory was established in 1894, before Arizona was a state. What other sites were considered? Oh, so it was all of those. It was Tucson, Tombstone, Tempe, and Prescott. Right. Um, Percival Lowell had, had uh, hired an assistant named Andrew Douglas to travel around the territory. Again, this is Arizona territory. It wasn't a state yet. Take a telescope with them and some um, instruments to take um, atmospheric as well as astronomical measurements. You know, look at the barometers and temperatures as well as looking through telescopes at distant objects to see how clear the sky is. Um, and he went all across the territory. He started in Tombstone, went to Tucson. In Tempe, he set up um, on the side of a mountain where um, ASU football stadium is today. Luckily, they didn't choose that site. That wouldn't have been very good because it's in the middle of a lot of lights today. Right. Um, went to Prescott and then finally ended up in Flagstaff and said, you know, Flagstaff's a great location, high elevation, the less or the the higher the elevation, the less air you have to look through. Oh. Um, and, you know, think about, like, if you're in a swimming pool and you open your eyes and everything's fuzzy because the light is passing through water and water is bending the light, making it, making it blurry. Air does the same thing. If we had no air, um, you wouldn't have twinkling stars. But we have air. The light is passing through and, and the air... Um, cause it's like to blur or to twinkle. That's why we have twinkling twinkling. Oh, stars. I had no idea. Yeah. So so the higher the elevation, the less air you're looking through and the less twinkling. Um, you know, twinkling is great if you're on a date um, and you want romance, but for astronomers, you know, twinkling's not so good. Because <laughs> right. if, it's, if it's like that, what's it gonna be like when you're magnifying through the telescope? It's just gonna be you're not gonna be able to see any detail. Wow. So, Flagstaff was a good site, but as it turns out, we know that Arizona is a mecca for astronomy. Um, Tucson is certainly an outstanding site, and um, there are so many major observatories there today. Um, so the, the, the entire state is really a leader in astronomy, both research and education. And, you know, this is fun to be able to talk about stuff like this because there's, it, you know, it's the science that's being done but it's being done by people. And there's a lot of personality that you talk about. And there's a lot of quirky coincidences um, or, or things like 
connections, Diana Gabaldon and Stanley Sykes. Um, you know, it's just fun to be able to talk about this. Wow. You know, I want to say thank you so much for coming on and sharing what obviously is a passion of yours. But I mean, this really incredible history of Arizona that I mean, I've known a little bit of, but this was so fascinating, finding all these other little tendrils and threads. Well, it's great to share. And that, you know, that's what we do here is we want to make it fun for everybody. I mean, you know, we live in a stressful times in a lot of ways. And to be able to take a moment and do something that's enjoyable. And heck, maybe we'll learn something along the way too. Um, <clears throat> but it's really, it's really uh, you know, an honor for us to be able to you know, share this heritage with people. And that's why we try to make it as accessible as possible. So how can people find out about programs going on at Lowell? Well, you could go to our website, um, lowell.edu has everything that's happening. Um, we've got social media pages, Facebook, um, Twitter. Um, I drew a blank, but there's, you know, some of the other common face um, okay. social media. Um, we have, we have a blog or a, um, a um, well, we do have blogs being written, but we also have a podcast stall called um, Starry Skies. Ah. Um, and so we've got, we've got all sorts of different um, programs or just come up and visit. We're open pretty much every day except for major holidays and right now every night except for Tuesday. And so um, and the admission is great because if you come during the daytime, that's still good for that night. So you can you oh, know, nice. check out some of the cool historic stuff or go see, look at the sun safely during the day. And then at night, come back and look through the telescopes or hear one of our astronomers talk about the research or educators um, talking about, um, you know, mythology of the sky. Um, there's a lot of different different programs going on. And so the website really kind of explores a lot of that stuff. Okay. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on. Have a great rest of your night. And I definitely will see you soon in Flagstaff. Sounds great. Great talking with you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. You know, when you realize you're still muted and it's like, oh, you know, I always love to ask, how did people do? And, you know, a big shout out. Thank you to Kevin, because, oh, my gosh, who knew that we have twinkling lights because of the air? Yet, and what he didn't also mention that if you go to Lowell.edu, you can also find out that next month they are doing I Heart Pluto, a weekend of events. So there's so much you can do at Lowell. Um, and, you know, I can hardly wait to get up there and just kind of see what all is going on up there. So, you know, and, you know, I always like to say it's not how you did on the trivia, but look at all the amazing information stories and who knew being buried next to the observatory pretty much. Dang, that's pretty nifty. All right, so now as we get ready to go into From the Vault, I want to talk a little bit about um, 33, 33, 33 East Portland Street. So basically right downtown is this, constructed back in 1950, it was the arc-shaped Beth Hebrew Synagogue designed by modern architect Max Kaufman. Now, it's probably most well-known because it was, the, the congregation was founded by Elias Lowy, 
who was basically kind of like the, the Jewish Schindler. It's thought that he saved over 1,500 people from concentration camps during World War II. But by bringing on Max as the architect, who was an amazing, I mean, did many buildings around town, but this building in particular, I mean, he was an architect, an artist, astronomer. See, that's why we're talking about that building today. Um, he was also an Egyptologist. Now, one of the things I think is really cool is um, that building has now been preserved by Michael Levine. Um, there have been a variety of events going on there. Um, hopefully with COVID ending, more and more things will be happening there as well. Um, that raised roof you see a long line of windows allows a lot of sunlight to go into what easily could be a very dark building. But because he did that really unique raised roof, it allows light to come in on three sides of the building. Now, Max also, his, that photo, so he made his own telescope. He also was commissioned to be, he, cre he basically built a 70 inch telescope for University of Arizona for their Lunar and Planetary Laboratory that was 70 inches wide, 27 feet long, and he built it. So I think that's pretty amazing. Uh, that building that the Bethel Synagogue um, eventually became part of the Bethel Congregation, but then also became home to the Black Theater Troupe. When they got ready to sell it, um, it was thought to be a teardown. That's when Michael Levine stepped in, um, who has who was probably most well known for saving so many warehouses in the warehouse district, um, bought this, cleaned it up, brought it back to life. And really has been sharing a lot about the history. And if you have gone to go see the Fablemans, that is also where Steven Spielberg had his bar mitzvah was in that synagogue right there. And so you can check that out. You can drive by it. It is 333 East Portland. So it's well worth going to see. And now you'll see why I always say, you know, if you're on Facebook, click on that little share button because we are having so much fun with Arizona history. And next week is no different. We have Sanina Woods Harris. Um, you might have remember, we had just talking about Rip Woods having an exhibit out at Scottsdale Public Library in their gallery there, put on by Scottsdale Public Art. Well, this is his daughter. And so she is going to be our guest next week. So that's going to be really interesting. Some, I mean, all kinds of stuff, which you probably have, well, you have no idea. I can only hope. I think I know some of the things she's going to talk about. And it's going to be a lot of fun. That is next Thursday night at seven o'clock. Whatever you're, however you're watching it now, you tune in there next week and you will learn about South Phoenix and so much more. Oh, I can hardly wait. Oh, all right. So remember, I also love to hear from you all. So if you have questions, comments, please indeed share. I'd love to give a shout out to Cole and Chris who did that video at the very intro, as well as PJ for always keeping me up to date in terms of what's going on with booze around Arizona. And so as we say good night or bon voyage, um, since we're going into space, I am, since we're kind of doing an intergalactic theme, I am going to show a clip all about an event called Mask of the Yellow Moon. And speaking of extravaganzas, during most years between 1926 and 55, Phoenix College students joined those of the high schools in the Mask of the Yellow Moon, a music and dance pageant featuring literally a cast of a thousand. Staged at Montgomery Stadium on the Phoenix Union campus, the production often attracted national attention with themes of Americana and Arizona's history and heritage. A marvel of logistics, timing, and dramatic presentation. <laughs> 